You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 24, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, aerobiology and air sampling. Our presenter is Dr. Charles Barnes. He's an emeritus professor in the section of allergy, asthma, and immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, this morning, our first talk is um, by Dr. Uh, Charles Barnes. Um, Dr. Barnes, uh, for many years, was um, head of our um, allergy um, research lab here at Children's Mercy um, and is one of the uh, experts on aerobiology. Um, and um, he has graciously taken time out of his uh, um, retirement to come and uh, give us this talk this morning on aerobiology, air sampling uh, for pollen and spores. So um, uh, for the fellows, this sh uh, should be a great lecture, and we appreciate Dr. Barnes doing it this morning. Take it away, Charlie. All right. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about aerobiology, and, and it's really going to be kind of a practical uh, uh, presentation about uh, figuring out what's in the air and what's, uh, what's out there that causes people allergy problems during various times of the year. So when I first put this together, the, the Vogue was to put up questions for the uh, people to think about during the presentation. So I put up, I've got three questions here. Uh, which of the following is commonly used to collect air samples for aeroallergen estimation? Weather balloons, remote control aircraft, house dust, a Hearst spore trap, or a spectrophotometer. And the second is which of the following is a typical aeroallergen in Kansas City, oak pollen, ragweed pollen, elm pollen, grass pollen, or all of the above? And which of the following mathematical manipulations is used to produce air pollen counts in pollen grains per cubic meter of air? Uh, the first one is you square the radius of the collector times 3.14 and divide by the speed of the fan motor. The second is you divide the number of pollen grains collected in a 24-hour period by the volume of the air sample that day. And the third one is multiply the number of pollen grains collected per minute times 60 minutes per hour times 24 hours a day, or all of the above. And well, those are pretty straightforward, but you'll know the answers to those by the end of this, hopefully. Okay, so our objectives are to understand how air samples are taken for outdoor pollen and spore counts. Also, we want to understand how air samples are taken for indoor spore counts, uh, mostly spores or, or fungi inside. And we're going to review the major outdoor and indoor air allergens of the Kansas City area. Okay, so what is aerobiology? And, and oh, I, we, I was introduced to aerobiology by Jay, actually, uh, 30 years ago or a little more. And um, since then, I've noticed that uh, even NASA has an aerobiology laboratory that's uh, got a website. It's part of, the, part of NASA. And their motto is, answers to life are all up in the air. Our atmosphere is home to a wide diversity of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi. These tiny life forms may hold the clues to real, really big questions such as where and how life evolved and if it exists elsewhere in the universe. Uh, an interesting thing about uh, pollen and spores around the globe is the pollens change pretty dramatically from region to region. But the spores, which really get up in the air and fly around all over the place, are fairly the same just about everywhere you go. Uh, also, aerobiologists study the organisms and particles of biological organisms, or bioaerosols, that float around in the planet's atmosphere. Uh, these, mostly for our purposes, are pollen and fungal spores, but they also study flying insects and viruses 
and lots of other things. So aerobiology research is rewriting the book on Earth's atmosphere. It is helping us understand where life might exist elsewhere, such as on Mars. It'd be interesting to see what's floating around in the Martian air. Uh, we have seen an interesting exercise in aerobiology over the last uh, uh, five, six months or so because the COVID-19 virus uh, initially started out, people, when it initially started out, people were saying, well, no, it's going to be a fomite exposure. It's going to be, you know, you touch, an infected person touches their nose or gets viral particles on their nose. They touch a surface. The next person comes along and touches the surface and then touches their face. And that's the way it was transmitted. More and more, it's becoming understood that this virus has an aerosol transmission. Uh, when you sneeze or breathe or blow uh, little particles into the air, the virus transports through the air, and if the next person around you gets a large enough dose, they will come down with the virus. I have argued on many occasions the difference in importance between fomites and aerosol transmission, and for many years I lost that argument to the infectious disease people who said, no, 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 aerosol transmission is very, very minor. It's all fomites. And so I actually enjoyed watching the uh, aerosol transmission of COVID-19 come to the forefront a little bit. Okay, let's talk about collectors. We're, we're basically interested in collecting what's in the air. There are different kinds of collectors. These are just a few examples. Uh, and some of the manufacturers, Burkhart is one of the manufacturers, uh, Rotorod is also one of the manufacturers, and, and there are several others around, and, and we found more and more in the last 10 years or so. Uh, this is a typical uh, picture on the upper right, as you're looking at the screen, is a typical Burkhart collector. Right below it is a Lanzoni collector. That uh, is basic. These are basically two types of spore traps. The collector in the middle is a rotor rod or rotating rod type sampler, and the collector on the left is another type of spore trap. Except you'll notice that it's a horizontal design spore trap. The two on the right are vertical spore traps. We'll go over closely the operation of the uh, Burkhart on the upper right. All right, so Hearst spore traps have been around quite a while. Um, this was a publication from May 1972. It's, it's really amazing to think how primitive publications were just uh, 30, 40 years ago compared to some of the things that computers can do now. But basically, a Hearst spore trap draws in air through a small slit. So this first diagram here on the left hand side of the diagram part is a clock with a string wrapped around it that has the slide dangling from it and a small orifice. You draw a vacuum using a vacuum pump, some sort of vacuum pump in this chamber. Air comes roaring through the slit here. Anything that's heavier than the air goes smacking into the slide, which is coated with some sort of silicone grease or Vaseline or some sort of sticky surface that things will stick to. The air goes around and anything heavier than the air sticks to the slide. Of course, you've got to realize that there is a collection efficiency. Anything that's big and heavy is going to stick without any trouble. Anything that's really small and really light just might go around and not stick. And so there is a collection efficiency that increases as particle get, particles get larger or heavier, but uh, these are pretty good down to the sizes of small spores. They're not much good for, for viruses, typically. Uh, just as a curiosity, over here on the right-hand side of the diagrams is a slit sampler that samples onto a Petri dish, and so this is, would be an auger-filled Petri dish uh, with air coming in through a slit and impacting onto the petri dish. The petri dish is on a turntable, so it rotates over 24 hours. And you take this out and let it incubate for a day or so and watch uh, 
fungi mostly grow on the agar plate. So this is what the, the Anderson sampler looks like. It's exactly like the Anderson sampler that we have on the roof of the hospital that that Minotti, frankly, is not using right now. I think she's still collecting out of her backyard using an Allergenco sampler. But uh, this is basically a, a Burkhart-type sampler. Uh, some of the features, this is a wind vane or tail that's used to keep the collection unit facing into the wind. It rotates around the base here. There's a bearing in there that uh, allows this whole top unit to turn. The collection port is actually mounted in here, and it's in the shadow, and you can't see it. The, and to get to the collection port, you actually take a collecting device. Um, that uh, this, Here's an example of a collecting device that collects on a glass slide. This collecting device slides into the top and is secured by a spring lever at the top of the unit. And this is an example of the collection you get on a slide. Um, and you can see uh, various uh, you can see various activities that occur during the day on a slide like this. Uh, this would be say the slide was changed, and so early. In the day, you would have a lot of activity as people are coming to work, and then you would have, then that dies off, and then later in the day, you'd see a lot more activity as people move around and leave for work, and then during the night, as the atmosphere calms down, as the traffic calms down, there's a lot less activity in the air. And so uh, we have a slide like this for almost every day in Kansas City, and uh, well, we used to. And so you see, um, you see how you can track a lot of things on a on a slide pattern like this. This is an example of how the lever, the spring lever, operates. You just move the spring off to the side and remove the sampling head. This is a close-up picture of the sampling port that was in the shadow previously. And this uh, port pulls in air, ambient air from the outside. It goes, this is now looking at the top of the unit, uh, the slide on the bottom left. At looking down the top of the unit, the small hole here is where the vacuum is created. The air would come in through here, impact directly on the slide that is attached to a clock mechanism and on a 24-hour period the slide will gradually traverse the front of the collecting port and uh, material heavier than air is impacted on the slide and then that is viewed through a microscope and so since this is a actually a 1950s type design uh, these collectors I believe were first uh, designed to measure radioactivity in the air and so you can see how you could take a slide like this, put it on a piece of x-ray film, and if there's a particle, a radioactive particle in the air that was collected, it would definitely show up on the x-ray film. Uh, and so this is a, an old clock mechanism that basically operates um, for seven days. It's a, a, an old-fashioned seven-day clock, and uh, if you wind it, once a week. Um, this will operate for seven days and can be set to collect also on a drum of material. This is a one day collection, collection head whereby the slide is pulled in front of the slit over a 24 hour period. On this one, a drum is mounted to the clock and a, the, the side of the drum is covered in a piece of plastic Melanex tape and the tape is then covered with a slightly a greased surface of some kind and it moves 48 millimeters a day uh, two millimeters an hour in front of the collection orifice and so this would collect actually for seven days continuously and has to be changed after seven days 
for the pollen and spore report that we did on top of the hospital, we typically use the one day head during the week and on the weekends, we let this collect for three days or two days and um, then cut the tape off and viewed it under the microscope. Uh, this is an example of how to change the, the slide. Basically, you have to start the collector with the slide down. So the first collection that's in front of the orifice will be at the top of the slide and gradually the slide moves through the day. So the slide is just in a, a clip situation. It just simply slides in and out of this collection head. And winding the clock. Winding the clock was one of the things that gave us the most trouble because we're not used to winding clocks. And so we inevitably sometimes overwound it and sometimes underwound it. So it's uh, old technology, but still works very well. Um, and this is the, the, the one, I mean, the seven day drum sampler head that simply bolted using a large nut, uh, hand tightened to the clock. Uh, that's a little clock that just mounts on the collection head. So it's a very simple device. Um, and so the, the uh, clock, the one day collection head is just bolted to the clock and moves at 48 millimeters a day uh, for seven days around. Okay, but that's not the only type of collector. And this is one of the strangest collectors that I've ever seen. This is uh, Dr. Shields from Cornell, who had a grant to measure uh, fungal spores for tobacco blue mold. And he wanted to measure these at different levels above tobacco fields. And so he built a model airplane. He probably liked model airplanes anyway, with four collectors under the wings of the model airplanes. And so he would, uh, and tobacco was very important in, in uh, North Carolina, and so you could get the state patrol to actually stop traffic on the road so he could take his airplane off, and he would fly to a certain altitude over the tobacco field, open one of the collectors, let it collect for a certain time, couple of minutes, then he would close that collector, move the airplane to a higher altitude, open a second collector and collect at that altitude, and so he got a good example a good estimate of how much fungal spore or the fungal spore concentration above the tobacco fields at different times of the year. Uh, I don't think they renewed this grant uh, into the 1980s. Okay, but there are lots of alternative samplers. And then at one point I ought to make here that these samplers are used to provide a statistical estimate of the spores, of the spore concentrations of the air. Uh, we, the people who do this tend to talk about this as the spore count, like it's an exact count, but it's really not. It's just an exercise in statistical sampling. And so the counts you get are only estimates of airborne spore concentrations. Some of the other ones are manufactured by Lanzoni. We showed a picture of this earlier and the rotor rod and the Allergenco. Uh, some of the newer ones out there are the Buck BioAir. This is the one that uh, the environmental uh, sampling people use now in homes. Um, and they have moved to a modular concept whereby you don't have to handle the individual slides anymore. This is now, uh, there's several types of modular samplers available. One of the brand names is Aerosil. Uh, but the Allergenco has been also moved to a modular type of sampling. I'll show a picture of that a little later on. Um, some of the companies involved, at least the company involved in the Rotoron is Multidata. Uh, I have an address in St. Louis. Uh, I'm sorry, St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Uh, I tried to look up the company this year. Multidata was a company that was... Um, very active in radiation technology uh, using uh, for, for x-rays and things like that, collecting uh, information and producing instruments used in x-ray technology. 
they got in a little trouble with the FDA for not filing their paperwork a few years ago is, is the way it looked to me on the, on the internet. So I'm not sure this company is active anymore. They were bought by a company, called, or at least the uh, rotor rod stuff was bought by a company uh, in uh, Surveillance Data Incorporated in Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania. I tried to look up Surveillance Data Incorporated website, and again, I could not find anything active on them on the Internet now. I do know as late as five years ago, I was able to contact somebody uh, at Plymouth meeting and they were able to supply rotor rod parts to someone who, uh, who wanted them. Um, you do see on the internet, uh, pollen.com, uh, pollen.com basically provides, uh, estimates of pollen concentrations and they do predictions of pollen concentrations. And so they were, they will, try to predict the pollen concentration over Kansas City uh, for any particular day. They have a data set that was collected uh, using the rotor rod technology, and uh, their predictions are not terrible, but they're not that good uh, because they really can't take into account weather patterns and things like that. But I, I looked up the pollen.com website, it is still active, although uh, many of the links didn't work. So it looked like uh, it hadn't been updated for at least a while. The main pollen information uh, source in the United States, which uh, uh, at, in, uh, at Children's Mercy uh, you belong to, and Minotti sends them data every day, is the National Allergy Bureau. Uh, the National Allergy Bureau is part of the American Academy for Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, uh, and they provide accurate pollen counts on particular days. Um, many sites, and, and there are about 80 to 90 sites around the country um, that uh, have a Burkhart collector and go out on a daily basis and collect and count slides. Uh, many of them are allergist offices or allergy practices, some of the uh, St. Louis Department of, uh, of Public Health. So anyway, uh, most of the physician's offices uh, will only count maybe three days a week. They'll run their, their uh, Burkhart collector and put somebody in front of the microscope to actually count these pollen or three days a week, whereas uh, many of the hospitals, like uh, Children's Mercy, will count every day of the week and produce a count every day of the week. These counts are reported to the National Allergy Bureau, which presents them on a nationwide map. And you can see some of the sites of the National Allergy Bureau, like in Minneapolis and Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, in Dayton, Ohio, and in St. Louis and Springfield and even Kansas City and Omaha. So these uh, sites you can look up and see the pollen concentration of any particular day. Uh, generally what's displayed is the last pollen count that was turned into the National Allergy Bureau, but um, the, uh, uh, if, you, if you go to the website you can sometimes get uh, graphs of historic data back to uh, back several months. And if you want to do a research project, you can apply to the National Allergy Bureau for a electronic download of their data that will provide uh, data back for several years. And they, this database has been up and active since uh, Jay actually got it organized uh, back around 2000. And so they've got a good 20 years of data uh, in the bag. And actually, they've got some data that's even older than that because some, uh, some sites have downloaded their historic data to the National Allergy Bureau. Um, so let's talk about the rotor rod for just a minute. Um, the rotor rod is, is much less expensive than a Burkhardt. You could buy a rotor rod. They're, even their fanciest model was less than $2,000, where I think uh, <clears throat> even, even 25 or 30 years ago, 
the rotor, the uh, Burkhart we bought for the top of the hospital cost us oh five or six thousand dollars just for the unit and the, all the equipment that went with it. Basically, it's a rotating bar with discs underneath it. And as these discs rotate through the air, these discs have a greased surface on the front. And as they rotate through the air, pollen in the air impacts on the rod and sticks to the greased surface. Uh, they are better than the Burkhart or the Hurst spore trap type in that they are really not sensitive to the wind. These rods are spinning so fast that the wind velocity doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And they're spinning in a circle. So it doesn't matter which way, the, which direction the wind is blowing, doesn't matter how fast the wind is blowing, uh, they're really not impacted by the wind. Whereas the Burkhart collectors need to be oriented to face the wind. And if the wind is blowing really fast, it takes a little pressure off the uh, motor that's driving the vacuum. And so you collect a little more air than you want. And if the wind is blowing slow, you collect a little less air. And so these things have to be calibrated routinely. But uh, the Burkhart is more sensitive to wind direction than the uh, rotor rod sampler. This is an example of the head that goes with the rotor rod sampler. These are the little lucite rods that uh, the uh, pollen impacts upon. You coat these in silicone grease. Uh, they can be on a solid rod or they can be made retractable. One of the things that the rotor rod is very sensitive to, though, is moisture and rain so if you've got uh, a good heavy rain and this thing is spinning it's going to wash most of what stuck to the surface off of the surface so they made a retractable uh heads where the rods when it starts to spin the rods actually come out from a protective coating cover and when it stops spinning they go fold back into the protective cover so uh these things typically over a you know, collect over a 24 hour period. They don't run all the time. They're typically set for, to collect maybe 10 minutes out of each hour. And so if you avoid the heavy rain during the time these things are spinning, you don't get the sensitivity to rain you can get if it's spinning all the time and washes falling off. Anyway, the uh, to view these, the lucite rod is taken out of the spinning uh, not while it's spinning, but the lucite rod is taken out of the holder and put on a stage. A stain is applied to the stage. A cover slip is put on, and these are viewed during through the microscope. And that's actually how you you get the particular counts um, to use for your for making your pollen and spore estimate. Uh, you basically look at these pollen under the microscope and you count them one at a time. This is a an example of a rotor rod collector actually spinning, and I like to show this. This is actually mounted upside down. Typically, you would turn it over the other way to do a little protection from the rain, but in this case, there was no reason to because they were collecting for a short period of time, and you can actually see the rods spinning around on top of it. I thought that was a, a good uh, illustration picture here. Uh, we did a little comparison, or and. and and other people did a little comparison between the Burkhart collector and the Rotorod collector. And basically they found that as long as you're collecting large particles, the uh, like pollen, the Burkhart and the Rotorod get pretty good uh, numbers. They, they collected pretty evenly. But when you got into the smaller particles like spores, the Burkhart was a superior instrument, did a much better job sampling particles at 10 microns or less. And so size-wise, that means pollen is generally larger than 10 microns, and spores are generally smaller than 10 microns, not completely. And, and we'll have another talk on, on actual uh, the things and identifying things in the air, but uh, roughly uh, 10 microns is a good dividing point there. 
Uh, now, Minotti cu currently is using an Allergenco collector, and she is, uh, um, we, we got this Allergenco collector from Allergenco directly a few years ago. Um, Allergenco was invented by a man, known, a man named Grant Smith, who actually wrote the pollen identification book that the fellows will find in their office. If you haven't found it already, it's a very interesting book to read and to look at. Um, EMS is a supplier of uh, equipment to the home inspection industry. They provide things like um, carbon dioxide monitors, uh, spore, camp, spore collecting equipment, things like that. And so I know they are still in business in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And so this is what an Allergenco looks like. It, instead of collecting constantly, it collects in in increments. So you put your slide on a stage here, your coated slide, and set the stage to move and collect maybe 10 minutes out of every hour. And so you would get a good estimation or maybe 10 minutes out of every four hours. So you would get a good estimation of the number of spores in a particular or a number of pollen in a particular collection. And so you'd know about what was in the air at that time. Uh, they, are, they are rechargeable. Uh, they have a rechargeable battery that comes with them, but basically, uh, most of the time, we'd, let, we'd leave it uh, plugged in, and it collects uh, uh, from the air with the air coming in through the slit on the top. Now, that means that it's going to be very sensitive to rain, and so typically, we would provide some kind of roof or shelter for this. Uh, several of these shelters were built by the, uh, the wood shop at Children's Mercy. Uh, I think all of those have gone away, although Jay may still have one in his backyard. Um, but uh, we used this collector for a couple of years um, and found it to be very reliable. And did a little uh, comparison between this and the Burkhardt and found that basically, even though it wasn't designed to face the wind, uh, it was comparable to the Burkhardt in uh, collecting both pollen and spores. And so it was, uh, its efficiency for spores was equal to the Burkhardt and better than the rotor rod. Now, recently, the guys who go out to the houses and do sampling have gone to a Buck BioAir, and so this is a completely contained a rechargeable unit that's got a pump in it, and you mount a modular uh, collection collecting device on top of the Buck Bio Air, and you do one collection per device. And so this is going to work very well for people who are going into houses and collecting, but for somebody who wants to collect outside for 24-hour period, uh, it's not going to actually do that that good a job. It's not going to be adequate for that. They picked up the Allergenco name because the uh, geometry on the collecting head of the old Allergenco collectors was really, really good. And uh, it did a very good job of collecting it. It was very efficient. So we did a little comparison between the um, Burkhart and the Allergenco and found that for most um, air speeds or most wind velocities, the, the collections were essentially equivalent um, for pollen. Actually, uh, if pollen loads were high, the Burkhardt actually tended to saturate a little bit in the end. The Allergenco being a little more flexible and timing could be set to, to better collect the pollen. Uh, or for spores, the two were very, very equivalent. Uh, depending upon the wind velocity. Um, and typically ambient winds in Kansas City are 15 miles an hour or below. So uh, we really had no problem uh, collecting with the allergen coat during that time. But we did switch to Burkhart uh, later on. 
So let's let's just talk for a minute about what's in the air pollen-wise. These are the top 10 pollens in Kansas City approximately by what time of year they appear. We start generally with elm, although we have had years where maple has come in before elm. Uh, and cedar can pop up any time of the year. Typically, the weather conditions get right in uh, February and March for cedar. But if we have a really warm winter and in January the, the uh, atmospheric conditions are just right and they, it wants a cool morning with a little rain, uh, we get our cedar pollen early. Uh, and then we get into oak season, mulberry season. There's lots and lots of mulberry trees around Kansas City and they produce a lot of pollen. Uh, then we start with the weeds. Sorrel, generally, we get, generally get a little sorrel before we start to get grass pollen, then that after the grass pollen is gone, we get plantain, which is which will last two or three months. Then ragweed comes on, and we've got ragweed season going on right now. My little uh, earlier today, my little dog went outside and came back inside and jumped in my lap, and she was just coated in ragweed pollen, and I immediately started to sneeze. And then we get kenopods uh, and and amaranth, and then the the Kenopod amaranth taxonomy has gone back and forth for several years, but now all of the kenopods have been placed into the amaranthus family, but they still have the kenopod uh, portion of the amaranthus family, and we call these kenopods. Uh, so this is what elm looks like, and so this is the stained pollen uh, that you'll see under the microscope. This is not what it looks like when it flies through the air. When it flies through the air, it's it's dried up and desiccated and and twisted and gnarled, and you really uh, you really can't uh, spot. You can't see uh, that it's an elm from anything else when it's flying through the air. But when it's collected on the slide surface, uh, mounted and stained with a stain that causes the pollen to swell and it has a basic fuchsin in it that causes the various characteristics of the surface to stain purple or dark and you can see an outside, an exine, or an, and an inside which is known as an entine and we'll talk about um, the anatomy of pollen at a later talk but uh, this is what they, this is what an elm pollen looks like under the microscope this, of course, is what an elm tree looks like. Uh, you see these all over the place. We had uh, Dutch elm disease come through Kansas, come through the United States, actually, in the 20s and 30s, killed off most of the uh, Native American elms. And so, so this elm was actually imported from the Orient. Uh, another thing we can, we've got from China. And so a lot of times these are known as Chinese elms or paper elms because the the seed they produce is about dime size, and it looks like a little flat dime sized piece of paper with a spot in the middle of it. And this is what the elm uh, up on the right hand side, it's what the elm leaf actually looks like. It's a nice serrated leaf that's uh, pretty common around Kansas City. Then maple trees, and we've got lots of varieties of maples in Missouri here. Uh, this is what the pollen looks like. I noticed that uh, my image got a little granular in the translation to a PDF file. I'll have to improve that. But um, this is they're the ones that produce the little helicopters uh, that you see coming down in the spring. And they produce the, the two-bladed helicopters. The ash trees produce one-bladed helicopters. Uh, and this is kind of what an elm tree looks like. Uh, in the native in the wild. Uh, this is a a cedar or a juniper tree. Uh, they're all part of the Cupriaceae family. Uh, they are known as the Pac-Man pollen because when you put the stain and the fixative on the, these pollen, the inside of the pollen swells up and the outside of the pollen is not hard enough to contain it, and so it pops open, and the interior of the pollen breaks out. And so 
when these pop open, most of the time they will get the little Pac-Man uh, looking character to them. And so um, Cedar, when we first started collecting back in the 90s, uh, Cedar was not one of our big ones, big pollen. But since then, we have actually had cedar trees uh, move into our area uh, a lot more profusely than they were back then. And so we have a lot more cedar. This is a typical cedar tree that's out in my pasture right now. And if you shake it during pollen season, you know, you throw a rock or something at the tree and take a picture, you get actual puffs of pollen off of this. And so cedar has the ability to produce large amounts of pollen. Uh, and it's become, I think, one of the, uh, the big allergen offenders in our area. Uh, oak trees, uh, Kansas City planted a lot of uh, elm trees and they were pretty heavy pollen producers and pretty trashy trees. And they, you know, branches fell off of them and they stopped up the gutters. And so when Overland Park developed, they said, well, we're not going to make the same mistake Kansas City did. We're going to plant oak trees. And so they now have, on, you'll notice on the Kansas side, you have a lot more oak pollen and a lot more oak trees. And this is, again, got a little granular in the translation. But basically, like the elm trees, it has three slits in it. and uh, it's about the same size, but comes on later than elm. But the oak trees produce their pollen off of lines of flowers. And so this is essentially an oak tree flower. It's on a string. It's known, this whole string along with the little flowers that are attached to it are known as catkins. And the pollen here is produced on the little flower that is... Uh, hanging off the catkin and of course these things fall to the ground and they also plug up the gutters and uh, downspouts and so on the kansas side if you park your car under an oak tree during oak pollen season you will have a yellow haze on top of your car not nearly as bad as you get in the in the south in atlanta during pine pollen season where is where when you plant park your car under a pine tree, you get a whole uh, yellow coating on your car, very much heavier. Uh, mulberry, you don't really notice mulberry trees, but um, mulberry produces a small uh, diporate pollen. Generally, it has two pores on the side. This is a very, very old mulberry tree that's out in my pasture also. Uh, this thing produces a lot of mulberries, and I have gone out there and picked and eaten mulberries uh, off of this tree. It's, it's really old and really big for a mulberry tree. Typical mulberry tree is very much smaller. And so whenever you find a, a place where a lot of brush has grown up, um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of very wild and, uh, and uh, not cut or mowed or, or groomed in any fashion. A uh, majority of the trees in there will be mulberry trees and they produce pollen and they produce a lot of pollen because this mulberry has that this one little individual mulberry has hundreds of small seeds in there and each one of those seeds had to be fertilized and so the mulberry had to produce enough pollen to fertilize all of these seeds on all of these individual mulberry fruits and so when you think about it that's a lot of pollen. The next one is a weed. It's sorrel. And uh, people actually can have picked this uh, and, and cooked it or uh, eaten it raw as a sorrel salad. But it produces a, a seed head and a uh, pollen that is trichoporate. And that means it has both slits. And you can barely see a slit on the pollen up here and pores. So there's a little hole in the slit here. Uh, sorrel comes along in the spring. We don't, I don't think we get as much sorrel as we used to, especially in town, although we do get a lot more sorrel here in the country. Um, grass, all grass looks alike, even corn, which is a grass, 
is a rounded pollen with a single pore or it's monoporate. And all the grasses in the, in the graminae or poaceae family, they're monoporate. Um, and all of the northern pasture grasses uh, like rye and fescue and orchard grass and brome are related to each other. And so it's very, very likely that the person that's allergic to one of the northern pasture grasses is allergic to multiple of the nor northern pasture grasses. And then grasses like Johnson grass, which is the picture in the lower uh, right, and Bermuda grass and Bahia grass are related, but not as closely as the northern pasture grasses are related to one another. But they still produce a pollen that's monoporate. And so basically, looking through the microscope at the pollen, I can't really tell one grass from another. Uh, plantain or plantago, uh, there are two types of plantain. One is the plantain lanceolata, which is the one it, when you mow your yard and the next day you've got these little spikes sticking up, that's plantain, the English plantain, plantago uh, lanceolata. The plantago americana is the American plantain. It's a much shorter plant and has the big leaves, but these things can grow anywhere. I mean, you'll see a, a gravel driveway that's bare of vegetation except for this one or two round leaf plants with the spikes, flower spikes sticking out of it. And that is American plantain. And uh, this starts to pollinate uh, about this time of the year, about, uh, I'm sorry, about uh, July, you start to get plantain. And plantain can run all the way through September sometimes. And you'll see it starts to flower from the bottom of the spike here and gradually flowers and flowers and flowers as time goes by. And so you can see, if not cut down, these things will pollinate and produce flowers and pollinate for uh, weeks at a time. And then we have ragweed and there are two kinds of ragweed in our area. There's the giant ragweed, which has the large flowered leaf here, I mean, sorry, the, the large uh, multi-lobed leaf. Uh, these giant ragweed uh, can grow eight feet tall. I've got a couple out in the pasture right now that are probably seven feet tall. And uh, the seed, I mean, the, the uh, flowering head comes out of the top of these. There's also short, short ragweed and short ragweed has a leaf that with a very much finer structure, uh, a much uh, finer lobular structure on the leaf. And these can flower not only from the top, but also out of the sides. Uh, the two pollen spikes don't exactly overlap. Giant ragweed puts on uh, flowering heads and pollinates first. And then shortly, and this generally peaks about the first or, you know, about the first of September. And then the short ragweed tip tends to peak about the second weekend in September. And so these typically overlap a lot. And so our, normally our highest ragweed concentrations come around the, the first or second weekend in September. And ragweed pollen, this is what they appear to look like under the microscope. Um, are sub echinate and remember what an echidna is if you ever played sonic the hedgehog uh video game remember he's spiky and the hedgehogs are spiky and echidnas are also spiky but this is not quite as spiky as some other pollen but this is a typical ragweed pollen if you focused up and down on using the microscope you'd notice this was lobular and uh had three lobes to it with furrows, but what you really spot is the spiky appearance. And this just looks irritating from its very uh, beginning. And then we have kinopods or amaranthus. Um, kinopod has really been popular in recent years because kinopod is kiwa or kiwa, the uh, food that's gotten so popular lately that doesn't taste bad at all. 
as long as you take the uh, take the exterior off of the um, the seed, the exterior tends to be very bitter. But if the exterior is properly removed, um, then you get those uh, pretty good grain. Uh, these things are known as uh, lamb's quarters or pigweed. And so just about anything somebody comes in and says it's, it's pigweed or rag or Johnson weed or, or um, iron weed or something like that, those are generally kenopods they're talking about. And kenopods are multiporate here. Uh, let's skip the indoor sampling bit and move on to the, because we're running a little low on time, uh, indoor sampling using something like an Allergenco with an aerosol, uh, I'm sorry, a, a modular aerosol unit, or even a multi-step Anderson sampler here. Uh, we'll talk about that at a later time. And there are all kinds of indoor collectors for, mostly for fungi. Uh, this one is just handheld and collects on a strip. This one collects on a plate. This one collects on a plate for viable uh, spore counts. And talk about the top 10 spores in our area. And you've, you've seen these names on Minotti's report, Cladosporum, Ascospores, and Basidia spores. So when, when uh, fungi was first found in the air, uh, people noticed that they, some of them looked very characteristic, and then some of them were just sort of little round circular things. Well, it turns out there, there are a couple of major families, and one is the Ascomycetes, and the other one is the Pisidiomycetes. And so everything, uh, about half of what's out there is Ascospores, or Ascomycetes, and the other half is Pisidiomycetes. All the rest of these names, Cladosporum, Altineria, Epicoccum, Pithomyces, Bipolaris, uh, are part of the Ascospore family because, uh, the Ascospore group, sorry, because um, spores have sexual stage reproduction and asexual stage reproduction. And of course, if you're having asexual stage reproduction, that means they reproduce true to form. In other words, one alternaria in the asexual stage reproduction will look just like another alternaria spore, which will look just like another alternaria spore. But if they go into the sexual stage reproduction, that means you're mixing genetic materials from two organisms, the alternaria spore will not be recognizable as an alternaria spore. And so those tend to simply get grouped as ascomycetes or ascospores. So let's look at the pictures of some of these. Uh, this is Cladosporum. Name, the name uh, originates from the fact that they cleave together and they stick together. And so a characteristic of Cladosporum, they're kind of sausage shaped. They have an attachment site on either end here. And so a cladosporum will have at least two attachment sites where it grew from one spore and it grew another spore coming off the other side. And often cladosporum will have three or more attachment sites. So it grew from one site. It had one spore coming off of it here, one spore coming off here, and another spore coming off here. And so they can be identified by their sausage shape and the fact that they have multiple attachment sites. Now these are ascospores right here. And you can see they generally, they do not have attachment sites. Ascus is the old uh, Roman word for bag or sack. And since they come from uh, sexual reproduction, they are produced in a sack of eight spores. And the sack breaks open and spills these spores into the air. And most of the ascomycetes actually hold on to their spores until conditions are favorable for reproduction. That basically is when we get a rain and uh, rain material, you know, rainy weather and high humidity. In high humidity, these sacks split open and just dump their spores out in the air. And so the spores really are 
you know, they don't really have a characteristic look. They can look lots of different ways and they don't have an attachment site. And so they just lumped into undifferentiated ascospores is how the um, National Allergy Bureau classifies. Them. And likewise, basidia spores and basidia is the most common basidia spores we see as mushrooms. And so they grow on a site on the underside of a mushroom. And there are about eight, there are eight of them attached around the site. And so basidia spores generally have a little color to them. They're brown or yellowish. And they are typically always asymmetric. They have an attachment site and a germ pore, and they are just a little asymmetric because they grew around in a circle sticking off of a, a stool or basidium. Now, Alternaria is an ascomycete, and it, they grow, uh, this was grown in the laboratory on a Petri dish, and they grow attached to one another, but they have a very characteristic club shape with a, I always like to call it a tail, but most mycologists will say it's a beak on it. And so there's a pointed end. It has both longitudinals, longitudinal and transverse septations. These are smuts. Smuts and rusts are plant parasites. Smuts appear as just sort of little, little brown fuzzy balls under the microscope. Oftentimes they will stick together they're plant parasites, and so you will hear of them spoken of as corn smut or wheat smut, like that. And so uh, then the next one is Epicoccum. Now, Epicoccum, again, is an ascomycete. It's got that kind of uh, Hulk appearance to it, or the soccer, a lot of people will say a soccer ball appearance to it. Pithomyces, again, it has longitudinal and transverse septations, an attachment site, at least one, but it doesn't have the beak that Alternaria has. And rusts, again, rusts are plant parasites. Uh, so we see a lot of them around here, especially during harvest time. If you've ever noticed a, a combine, combining wheat or corn, there's a big cloud of dust coming off of that. A lot of that dust is fungi, either alternaria or rusts or smuts or something else that grew on the exterior of the plant. Uh, Bipolaris, Drescheleria, Homenthosporum, they all basically look the same. They've got this uh, long, they, they got this sausage shape, and you can see internal structure in them. And then Aspergillus and Penicillium, the little round thing that you can barely see that's that's you know maybe a micron maybe a couple of microns is the spore itself i can't see if i'm just looking at the spore under the microscope i can't tell which is which aspergillus or penicillium but if i can see the structure that the spore formed on then i can tell the difference and this structure on the right is an aspergillum if anybody remembers what an aspergillum is remember when they invest a new pope, the guy comes down the aisle with a, a uh, vessel of holy water, sprinkling it to either side. The little uh, unit that he is using to sprinkle it with was known as an aspergillum. And since this looked the same, this has been known as an aspergillum. And the fungus is known as an aspergillus. Whereas this one on the left is sort of finger shaped is known as penicillium, and a penicillus is a is the Latin word for paintbrush. And so this is kind of a, a paintbrush structure, the aspergillus penicillium. Uh, one last point is there are lots of collectors. This is a collector that actually can collect viruses out of the air. And uh, this and its predecessor, this and its successor, uh, are used by the military and the post office to collect all kinds of things, including anthrax from the air and post offices. Uh, they can analyze this by visual counts, culture methods, enzyme immunoassay methods, or 
even PCR methods to tell you exactly what you've got in the air. And when you do this, if you collect, and we collected on the roof of the hospital, and actually measured the ragweed concentration in the air versus the ragweed particle count in the air, and you can see they correspond, but not ex exactly. And so when you're talking about particle counts in the air of pollen, you're using it as a surrogate for the amount of allergen in the air. But there may be allergen in the air when the particle counts are not so high because not all particles, uh, not all pollen grains have the same amount of allergen in them and uh, not all allergen material is released into the air on pollen grains, although probably most of it is. And so that's the, uh, that's the end of the talk.